Hi, thank you everyone for coming. And uh, before I make my speech, I have to make you watch our uh, little video. It's just 45 seconds. So welcome everyone uh, to the mills today. You're all sitting in the uh, atrium uh, called the Fabrica Atrium. And I would also like to take the opportunity to introduce the entire mills project, which I'm sure uh, many of you are very curious about. Um, the Mills project was conceived as an idea back in 2014 when these three mills, Mills 4, 5, and 6, formerly cotton spinning mills built in the 60s, uh, are now dis were disused, derelict, and used as go-downs. So the founder of the mills, uh, Vanessa Cheung, she decided to embark on a very ambitious journey to conserve these mills and to reactivate them as a hub for creativity that includes uh, CHAT, which is the nonprofit art and cultural center, and also Fabrica, the business incubator, and Shopfront, which includes very experiential retail. So with these three pillars, we hoped that the mills uh, would bring you a very uh, holistic ex uh, journey uh, where you could experience the culture of textile and also understand uh, the industrial history of Hong Kong, but also it's a platform where new ideas can be discussed and realized. Uh, with that, I also would like to take the opportunity to in introduce Alex, our colleague from Fabrica, to say a few words about the incubator uh, program. Thank you, Chin Chin. Um, so warm welcome to the mills and warm welcome to the space here, which is actually the, um, we call it fabrication, is the innovation uh, platform within the mills. So when Vanessa started the mills project, part of the thinking was really about how can we preserve the best of Hong Kong's heritage and history in textiles, but at the same time, it's still a way to also combine it with some of the things that's happening going forward and to inculcate some of the new technologies that's happening. If you look at when most companies think about innovation, very few companies would start by thinking about the past. And that's Vanessa's vision in terms of, um, given that we started in a, as a textiles factory, is there a way that we can actually support innovations in the textiles and fashion scene? So we run a lot of programs uh, that support startups uh, innovating in fashion and textiles. We do incubation, we do investments. And uh, in the space here, you would also get to visit a prototyping lab at the back. And it's really to create a new platform for experimentation for startups. So feel free to check it during a break. Uh, I'll give you one example of a company that, uh, a lot of companies that we work with, what they do is really to look at a traditional industry and think of a way to actually uh, add new innovation to it. So one of the companies that we support is a company called Unspun, and they do customized uh, tailored jeans by taking your 3D body measurements and then sort of weaving uh, denim jeans directly. So they actually have a store just open uh, below in the mall as well. So feel free to check that out. And the last thing I would say is that whenever we think about the Mills project, we always like to say it's about connecting to time. How can we both celebrate the best of the past? How can we both uh, combine it with the new things by looking towards the future? So as you go through the two-day symposium, as you go visit the mills, um, think about how the old connects with the new, think about how the past connects with the future, how heritage connects with innovation, and have a lovely two days uh, here. Thank you very much. So thank you, Alex, for that lovely speech. I would like to hand it over to Mizuki, who would talk about the Textile Series, uh, te uh, textile series 3.2 Discussion Forum. And the topic this year is Textile Legacies Now and Future. 
Thank you, Jinjin. And um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for being here this Saturday afternoon. So, um, let me briefly introduce uh, the, about the topics of this year's editions. The heritage is uh, such a charming word today. Heritage is used for the tourism, marketing, and the branding of the cities to enhance the people's awareness to the traditions and the identity of the places, retaining legacies of former generations. Throughout our research of textile museums in Europe, America, and Asia, we have noticed that quite many of them are housed in the former factory buildings, narrating glorious past of the, of the industry. This is interesting contrast with the contemporary museums by star architects such as Frank Gehry, Ando Tadao, and Jan Nobel, which are designed to be the monument of the present. Likewise, Textiles are regarded as heritage to illustrate local craftsmanship and the traditions, but the, in reality, in most of the regions, traditional craftsmanship have been lost due to the cheap mass production. We believe that both museums and textiles are vehicle cool not only for preserving the past, but also for deploying the past for the building a better future. For this third edition of the textile series, 3.2, and we have invited speakers who attempt to reactive and reinterpret textile legacies by making artworks, exhibitions, and online or live platforms. We hope this forum could be an opportunity for learn different ideas from each speaker, getting inspiration and finding the way to collaborate across our skills, critical knowledge, and their expertise. So, and also we would like to ask the um, um, engagement to this forum. So we put the uh, small stickers uh, on the mushroom table behind you. And during the tea breaks, please um, uh, contribute to give the question to us and stick on the whiteboard. So at the end of the forum, we are having the one hour um, the Q&A sessions. Our moderator is gonna pick up the, some of the questions to activate the discussion. Okay, so enjoy the day. Thank you. So now we are going to invite the first speaker, which is also the keynote speaker of this forum to kick start, Ms. Koki Kazuku. May I please invite you to come to the stage, please? Ah, okay. Thank you. Oh, that's mine. I need it. It's open. Hello, everybody. Um, once you're born, what is the first material that Your skin touches. I think it must be very, very soft, natural cotton. And it is a kind of global truth. I should change. Yeah. <laughs> should I start again all over? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, textile. It's the first material that we encounter in this world. And strange, as our consciousness goes and life goes on, we meet countless different kinds of materials. This is one part of my poster. I will talk about it later. Oh my, <laughs> this is me. Way back then, my mother was uh, editor, publisher of a dressmaking magazine in the 1930s, and would cast me as her model. I often think of my favorite clothes, textiles, and of course, dresses, blankets, etc., from my childhood. At one time, I recall that I treasured one particular Tenugui. Yeah, thank you. 
you know, the Japanese uh, hand cross. This size, you know. A traditional Japanese wash cross and used it until the white parts got almost brown. It was wartime. And we were suffering from the shortage of fabric or actually almost any raw materials. Then, when the war ended, Japanese everyday life gradually recovered. And in the 1950s, I remember my father returning from a trip abroad, bringing back the most beautiful handkerchiefs I've ever seen from Switzerland. They had flowers and a country maiden wearing a folk dress, quite a touristic embroidered image. But for me then, it was something that I had never seen or touched before, and it became one of my treasures of those days and an eye-opener for me into foreign textile products. For everyone, there are many such stories related to their memories of family, friends, and some particular environment. So there is no end of examples regarding this sort of episode. As you already know, Japanese textiles have long been enjoyed in the shape and pattern of the kimono. Elegant silk kimono, hand spun, hand woven, hand dyed, sometimes through techniques like shibori, the tie dye, and then with embroidery included. Ah, they bring together all of the best craftsmanship which we saw treasure in Japan. But those second kimono are mostly for festive occasions. And historically, the kimono for daily wear consisted mostly of cotton textiles. And here's another example. This is uh, the daily kimono usage, a very good uh, sample worn by an important lady of Japan's textile field, Madame Eko Otsuka. She founded a school of textile study and both encouraged and revived the traditional as well as futuristic technology. Along with Mr. Junichi Arai, and then joined Mr. Arai, then joined later by Reiko Sudo of Nuno Works. In my late teens, I discovered a craft shop in Ginza, founded by Masako Shirasu, a great lady, a writer, who is totally knowledge, knowledgeable of Japanese art, from historical paintings and Buddhist sculpture to performance art, such as No and Bunraku puppet plays. Her research and interest developed from the study of tea ceremonial tools to objects of daily life, including textiles and many related objects. Her collection of textiles had many hand-woven cotton samples, which show the most fundamental beautiful stripes, plaids, geometric e cut patterns, as well as deep colored plain, plain dyed cloth. Hi. Since my mother was a brilliant seamstress and dressmaker, I asked her, much better, thank you, <laughs> to fashion me some one-piece dresses using Madame Shiraz's cotton striped cloth, and I wore them re repeatedly. Then I started tracing back the history of traditional weaving of Japanese stripes and found the most beautiful archive materials. Those are sort of sample notebook, which each craftsman makes for themselves, archiving their own weaving history. 
I recently found one of family samples. Thank you. Ah, so next, you must say. This is such a tiny, tiny notebook. Now, whenever I open the pages. I am taken to those days in the workplace scene and can't help becoming sentimental, thinking of their committed thoughts and handwork while making beautiful new and old family textiles. The most anonymous, authentic, essential, and fundamental. Fundamental cloth making can be found here. Through these notebooks, one can perhaps inherit the craftsman's unconscious text found in his weaving. Thank you for for holding. <laughs> this is one weaver's family's sample book from the 1920s, illustrating the typical citizen's cotton-striped daily wear. Isn't it impressive how we can follow his or her weaving trials, tests, and ideas, etc. There are many different names for shima, the stripes. The word shima in Japanese means island in English. So it's easy to see how striped textiles from foreign lands became the first striped samples used by weavers. It's interesting that many of the stripes have imaginative word names. My favorite one is the very sinister stripe called blind stripe. Because it is so fine that you can hardly identify the lines. However, the word blind stripe was banned because blind is said to be insulting or prejudicial according to some people's opinions. Craftsmen are disappearing, and so too are some imaginative words from tradition. I guess they are an endangered species, don't you think? I see so many trials of ikat weaving and stripes and this must have been on the loom of uh, one family. Now, Issei Miyake, in his first book entitled East Meets West, which I edited with Iko Tanaka, the great art director of Aira, shows the design Issei created for contemporary clothes made for urban city people of Japan and the world. It's on the left side. And another two books which I did with uh, Mr. Iko Tanaka are there. Issei cast his friends who all share the passion for the creative movement of that era. In this picture, we are wearing Issei's sashiko or kilt knit series. Issei revived and created sorry, Japanese uh, cotton stripes of Japan and showed the direction of uh, we should, what we should be headed in for contemporary society. It's already been some 40 years, but still his concept is vivid and alive. Issei Miyake's fabulous collection series on daily clothes was once shown to the public 
in my exhibition space, an alternative space about which I will later talk. Issei was developing his cotton and natural fabric line for daily wear following the context of workers' clothes. Plantation is the name of this brand. He showed the lineup of clothes by inviting the contemporary dance group called Momix to perform in it. My interest in the textile and related clothing culture grew and grew, and soon I found myself a curator of both design and contemporary art. To make a very long story short, I want to show and share my experiences in how much I enjoy dealing with textiles and related art. I founded an and opened an alternative space for art and design where I could experiment with new horizons of creation. For textile design, firstly, I chose Junichi Arai, whom many of you may already know of. He is one of the most important textile designers in Japan. In the 80s, he was very, very busy bringing out new ideas for such fashion designers as Comme des Garçons, Yoji Yamamoto, Issei Miyake, and etc. many other names. The designers would ask Mr. Arai's help before each of their collection seasons, collection seasons, and he really tried his best for each of their orders. Proposing new expression of textile art and looking back on those days, I call them the days of tactile sense. At any rate, I discussed with this most successful textile king of the period to have a solo show of Junichi Arai. He agreed to mount an exhibition and on the opening day celebration, pre presented a performance of human textile weaving. Here it is. In the ex exhibition space, people stand alone on each and on both sides of the space, horizontal and vertical, all of them holding the edge of some fabric in the, new, in the row. And at the voice cue of Mr. Arai, each of them acted as the warp and the woof threads in the weaver's room. Over and under, over and under. The audience members, students, and staff all together wove an enormous textile at the end of the platform performance. It was such a simple idea but had all the participants happily satisfied with their weaving. I often think that without textiles, we cannot realize the concept of art and art or artwork. Well, when you think about that kind of thing, paintings, require a canvas, don't they? In other of our exhibition, Ray Naito, an artist, said that she needed a huge type of tent. Her art form concept was a universe made up of the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest pieces of things, such as plant seeds, small pieces of gauze, cotton balls, toothpicks, grains, etc. The tent was made possible by one of our friends, the architect Itsuko Hasegawa, together with the Taiyo Tent Company, oval-shaped. It filled an open 240 square meter space. Ray Naito's request was for textile which would be delicate but sturdy with the brushed surface making it as soft as flannel. 
several tests, the correct texture she was looking for was obtained. The interior of the tent was like a meditation area with only one person at a time allowed in as the artist was hoping the individuals would face the artwork alone. Feeling like returning back into a mother's womb, I felt that only a textile could have created such a space again. In the late 1990s, I curated a show of contemporary artists from Portugal. It mostly consisted of emerging young artists, but I decided to include one experienced elder woman's artwork. It consisted of black thread, stitches on a white cotton cloth. The image of Mont Saint Victoire by Cezanne was stitched like a sketch. Simple on the surface, it strongly expressed to me the depth of modern art history, front and back. Anna Jota is the name of the artist, now perhaps 70 years of age, but unknown to the art world until recent years. Amazingly, I had an email just last month and was informed that the German museum in Bremen is going to have a thematic show on Cezanne and they want to have the piece in the exhibition. Wow, my eyes were sharp to have found such a fabulous work of art some 20 years ago. Enjoying to see it every day on the wall in my private powder room. In the year 2004, at the time of my retirement from Musashino Art University, I organized an exhibition on clothing entitled Conceptual Clothing. I tried to show how the imagination of the artist and or designer can go beyond the conventional borders of clothing, textiles, art forms, including objects. Now I will point out some of the imaginative views found in the exhibition. Marie-Ange Guiminot from Paris presented an object called Sea Urchin. It was soft sculpture type of work using parachute cloth and blossoms like those of flowers and surprisingly, it turns into a cape or hooded coat. Takahiko, Takehiko Sanada took the time raising sheep and made a lot of yarn and then spread the wool on the gallery wall until it ended up in an object that was human-shaped. Vivoli Sims of New York filled the raised platform at the top of the university staircases with a huge dress of nylon to netting. It symbolized the power of dresses but on the other hand, seemed to refer to the overgrown fashion industry. Here comes the real poster. In the beginning of the 1980s, I found myself busily working on Muji launches, especially in the first Aoyama shop. Together with the art director, Iko Tanaka, and the design specialist friends, we conceive a new product line which provides for daily life 
at reasonable prices. It was a new private brand line by the Seiyu, that time, um, supermarket chain, with their merchandisers and creative team members all finding various possibilities and usages for the new line. At the beginning, we set out four, no, three, sorry. At the beginning, we set out three uh, fundamental uh, points to accomplish. Number one, a selection of materials. Number two, reduce some factory processes. Number three, basic, minimal, simple packaging. The economy was booming at the time and both European and American brands were selling well, even with very high markups. In a way, you could, we could foresee that the bubbly economy's prime time would soon be changing and that the most important point for a sustainable product life plan would be the right price for the right thing. For example, in a salmon or tuna canned product, we found that the national brand producers were using only the round central part of the fish body, while other delicious and useful parts of the tuna or salmon were not considered for canning. So too, with dry cracked mushrooms, while we found that they are just as tasty as fully round mushrooms. All these ideas are rooted in our finding marketable products from neglected materials in the production line. And essentially, our aim was to propose for the consumers the most basic minimalistic product at a low cost. Through our efforts at creating such a fundamental product line, we came up with fine cotton resources, and then I wrote the catchphrase, love is not pretentious, which we later altered to read, love doesn't beautify. This is the English title. And salmon is salmon. These are illustrations by you. Yuzo Yamashita. Note the baby in the illustration. I mentioned in the beginning that the first material coming into contact with the newborn baby is a textile. A concerned mother will surely choose the softest and safest cotton product. This is a desire born out of real love. And so we thought there was no need to have colorful and unnecessary decoration. Simple, soft, white cotton wear is what was believed, what we believe customers want. Muji started with 40 items and now the number of products is reaching 7,000. Our wish was and is always to provide a better everyday life for the consumer with comfortable production products and prices. One of our oldest posters demonstrates through illustration that baby wear reflects our concern for the best selection of textile materials. Now, I have some really fun images to show you. This is a 1988 project described as high fashion in the Japanese countryside. Sonomama, sonomama, stay as you are, 
right where you are. My dear friend and photographer, Taishi Hirokawa and the stylist Yuki Hata negotiated with some of the best selling fashion houses of that time to let them photograph ordinary people wearing those top fashion clothes in the Japanese countryside. I notice, as probably you do too, that the wearers are quite natural in their posing and seemingly willing to cooperate with what the photographer's team asked of them. They were simply asked to wear the clothes right where they were, working in the field or sea, and for example, playing in a priest's own temple, and so on. This is the priest wearing Issey Miyake's coat. The mega city is a place where consuming always takes place with the latest fashion on display. While people in the countryside do not have any criteria to judge what is in or new or dated. The gap we find in the mind and the body of city versus country people may be a theme we need to consider now and sometime in the future. But I think the future is your hands because in textile we trust. Thank you.